goodness, I hate these cold winter days. I just, when I get cold, I just, it doesn't matter how many layers I put on, I just can never seem to get warm, and I absolutely hate it. Most of you know, Thanksgiving just passed. This past Thanksgiving that we just had, my hometown here in Montgomery made national news for some horrible reasons. Uh, the tragic death of Anaya Blanchard and Sheriff Big John Williams. Um, well, thanks to my good friend, Craig Charlton, I'm reminded now of another Thanksgiving where my hometown, the city of Montgomery, Alabama, was in the national headlines. So today, I'm gonna be telling the story of Brent Springford. He was a, um, a wealthy Montgomerian who now he's more commonly known to the city of Montgomery, to this community, as the Thanksgiving Day Axe Murderer. Stay tuned for this story. You won't believe who his victims were. years ago now, on Thanksgiving of 2004, Brent Springford Jr. committed one of, if not the most gruesome murders in Montgomery, Alabama's history. The story I'm gonna tell today is gonna take us on a wild ride of a troubled young man who was raised by his wealthy parents in this very home that you see right here behind me. That Thanksgiving of 2004, Brent Springford Jr. snuck into his parents' home there and brutally murdered his own parents now with an axe handle. For most of his entire life, Brent Springford Jr. grew up in this home right there. He also suffered from psychological issues. He would go on later in life to be diagnosed with a bipolar disorder. And despite that, he had a great childhood. He and his sister Robin, they were raised there by both of their parents, Brent Sr. and Charlotte Springford. Brent and Charlotte made their fortune as the owners and operators of a Pepsi bottling plant. In fact, it is this Pepsi plant that you see right here behind me. We're in Luverne, Alabama now. It's about an hour away from Montgomery. And the reason that this Pepsi plant made them so much money was because of how successful it was, the location. There's no other Pepsi plant between Florida and Montgomery, all right? So if you bought a, a bottle Pepsi or a fountain Pepsi product anywhere in Southeast Alabama, it came from right here out of this Pepsi plant right behind me. For most of its existence, this Pepsi plant was the driving force of revenue for this entire city of Luverne. On that fateful Thanksgiving 2004, Brent Sr. and Charlotte Springford were found murdered and it sent shockwaves through the entire state. It could be felt all over Alabama, but mostly it was felt right here. Now, this Pepsi plant is still in operation. It is still going and it still provides all the Pepsi to Southeast Alabama, it's just no longer owned by the Springfords. In 1999, however, Brent Springford Jr., who was the heir to the Luverne Pepsi Bottling Company Empire, left his home here in Montgomery, Alabama, searching for something. He wasn't quite sure what it was that he was looking for, but he felt like something was missing. During his travels around the world, he eventually made his way to Boulder, Colorado, and he actually stayed right near the home where John Bonet Ramsey was killed. My name is John Bonet Ramsey, and I'm five and a half. Throughout his travels, he became infatuated with Buddhism. So while he was in Boulder, he enrolled into Naropa University, where he could study religion, and he also majored in spiritual guidance. 
Unbeknownst to everyone around him in Boulder, he was struggling with his mental health at the same time. He did a wonderful job hiding it, as in no one knew. Brent Sr. and Charlotte were just ecstatic about his decision to enroll in college. So they pretty much completely funded everything. They bought him a house in Boulder. They paid for Brent to live a very lavish lifestyle up there. So they bought him two brand new cars. They paid 100% of all his credit card balances. And they gave him an additional monthly allowance of nearly $1,000. Over time though, Brent Sr. and Charlotte started noticing Brent Jr. has started acting differently. By Christmas of that year, the Springford's annual black tie holiday gathering, which took place right here inside of their house, he showed up with a newly, completely bald shaven head, and he was wearing a monk's robe. He also spoke in a very strange manner. After he left that black tie holiday event, uh, his parents were mortified. They were absolutely mortified. They spent the next several months trying to convince Brent Jr. to seek psychiatric help. They themselves flew back and forth from Boulder to Montgomery several times and spared no expenses to get Brent Jr. to seek help. But nothing worked. He just didn't want to hear it. He quit communicating with his parents. He had even ran off and gotten married without telling his parents at all. Eventually, it got to the point where he would only correspond with them by fax. He would send them a fax if he needed to say something to them. But some time passed with the situation in really bad shape. Brent got a job to help send more money to his wife, who was uh, twice his age. She was 48. He was 24 at the time. Uh, her name was Carolyn Scout. So he went and got a second job just so he could send her more money. She was already getting all the money that his parents were sending. And he went and took on a second job to send her more. Over time, his parents, his parents discovered that he had begun acting more erratic. They also found out that he was working, making his own money. And it was about that same time that they learned of his marriage. Brent Sr. and Charlotte Springford believed that Carolyn Scout was only using Brent Jr. for the money. As some more time passed and we come around to October, they told Brent Jr. not to come home for his sister's wedding. Because of his erratic behavior, they couldn't trust him to come in, behave, and act like a normal human being. I mean, th that completely enraged Brent Jr. and put him in a panic. And then right after that, Brent Sr. and Charlotte would go on to do something that would set events in motion that would ultimately cost them their lives. They cut him off from all their money. Once they told Brent that they weren't supporting him anymore, it pushed Brent Jr. off the edge. Two weeks later, Brent boarded a bus from Denver, Colorado that brought him to the bus station here in Montgomery. He walked from the bus station to right here at his parents' house. When he got here, the house was empty and it was locked up. He couldn't get in. He didn't have a key. They had changed the locks on him. Brent Sr. and Charlotte, his parents, had left and went to Birmingham, Alabama to have lunch with Charlotte's family. Well, because Brent grew up in this house, Brent knew that one of these windows you see right here on the side of the house was not connected to the alarm system in the house. So he crawled through that window. He went inside of their, the living room, sat down, and then waited for his parents to come home. Several hours later, at about 6 p.m. that evening, Brent Sr. and Charlotte arrived home to find their son, Brent Jr., sitting in their living room, waiting for them with an ax handle right beside him. Several days later after that Thanksgiving, workers came here to the Springford home to finish laying floor tile in the kitchen. They had their own keys and they had their own alarm code to enter. When they entered the home that day, well, they initially suspected a robbery. Every, the house was destroyed completely. Everything was tossed and turned upside down and on, uh, flipped on its end. 
they started making their way through the house and they started calling out for Brent Sr. and Charlotte, yelling for them as they made it to the top of the stairs. They barely made it to the landing at the top there when they saw what they described as a scene that would haunt them forever. In their exact words, there was blood everywhere. That was all they could say. Brent Springford Jr. had beaten them to death with that ax handle. They were making funny noises, gasping for air. So he would go on to slit their throats to the point of nearly decapitating them so that he didn't have to hear them make those noises anymore. I mean, it was his own parents. He nearly decapitated his own parents. The finger was quickly pointed towards Brent Jr. But by the time that the bodies were found, a couple of days had passed, he was already back in Colorado. So two investigators from here in Montgomery traveled to Weld County in Colorado to interview Brent Jr. Yes, Weld County, the same Weld County where Chris Watts murdered his wife. This all happened in that same area. Um, at first, they sat down and talked to him. He denied any involvement at all. He says he wasn't even here for Thanksgiving. One hour after the detectives left from speaking with Brent Jr., Brent Jr. checked himself into a nearby psychiatric center. Well, it turns out that Mountain Crest Mental Health Clinic there in Colorado, they didn't have any beds open. So they transported him to Centennial Peaks Mental Health Clinic in Louisville, Colorado. He started getting his much needed medication that he hadn't had in a long time here in Montgomery. Investigators are reaching out to news stations for any information that can help them solve what happened to Brent Sr. and Charlotte. Well, Brent Jr. got word of this, and as he was heavily medicated, he started calling the local TV station proclaiming his innocence. He even said on air that he was in a mental facility in Louisville, Colorado. I have heard that the detectives Myrick and Davis suspect me for the murder of my parents. I've heard they are trying to build a case against me, and I don't know what that is about. I cannot believe all this is happening. I will call the media and let them know I am not hiding or avoiding anything. Well, the police got an arrest warrant, and on December the 9th of 2004, two Montgomery, Alabama police detectives and two Weld County, Colorado police detectives went to Centennial Peaks Mental Health Clinic and they took Brent Jr. into custody. They set him down in an interrogation room and they threatened to arrest his wife, Carolyn Scout, as an accomplice and Brent Jr. confessed to brutally killing his parents. He even went on to claim that a demonic spirit named Akasha had ordered him to do it. On December the 4th, of 2008, almost four years after his arrest, Brent Springford Jr. was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He was sent to Bessemer, Alabama to Donaldson Correctional Facility. Donaldson houses Alabama's most violent and mentally unstable inmates, which is why he was sent there. And sadly, in 2013, Brent Springford Jr. committed suicide somehow by taking a toxic dose of Tylenol. The state of Alabama hasn't released how he got a hold of the Tylenol that he took, but he took a lethal, lethal dose of Tylenol, overdosing on it and dying. Investigators assumed it had something to do with his parents cutting him off, but they always suspected that Carolyn Scout manipulated him to do it. During the investigation, she loved him so much. After his arrest, she only communicated with him one time. It was just before his trial and sentencing. She sent him a letter. It was really weird, and it was just one sentence on the letter. It said, if you get the death penalty, we support you. That was it. They had no other communications, but while I was researching the story and getting all the information, I saw another story that happened not that long ago where apparently another boyfriend of hers who had wealthy parents just like Brent, he was found dead and she was initially arrested but then released because it was proclaimed self-defense or something like that. So, uh, something's not right. That 
is going to do it for the story of Brent Springford Jr. and the murder of his parents. I want to thank you all for watching. I really, really appreciate it. As always, if you want to help support the channel and help fuel our adventures, check out the links down in the description box below. It, it means a bunch. Thank you all so much. I will see you again tomorrow. We're getting ready for Christmas, aren't we? I hope you all have a great day, and I hope you stay warm.